the winter 2024 anime season has come to a close. And what a truly interesting season it was. We had carryovers from the fall season that were already heavy hitters, so much so that it was questionable whether anything else could really outshine them. We had anything from a protagonist that did nothing but instant kill everyone, my neighbor's daughter is a yandere for me, psychological evaluations of my classmates, in another world with my triple bypass, moon spanking power lewd up, fantasy ghost in the shell, hot and steamy mecha action, the hunting association sucks at investigating malpractice. A wannabe licorice coil with androids. Yuri witches. Yuri labyrinths. Steamy siscon monster. Take your clothes off the anime. I still don't know what a fish daddy is, but apparently the English dub knows. And more, and more, and more, and more fern pout faces. As the dust settles, I have put together my top 10 anime of the winter 2024 season. Only stipulation that I have, as usual, is that the show has to actually end in the season. So yes, shows like Sengoku Yoko and Dungeon Meshi are going to have to wait their turn. But with all that said, let's just jump right into it. Kicking off my number 10, we have the most hyped show that could ever be hyped, which is yes, Soul Leveling. And despite that hype, I actually enjoyed the show. <laughs> I know, a shocking revelation, I know, I know. I think you're kind of in three different camps for this show. Either you're like massive hype and you're still massive hype and it's the greatest thing ever, or you're the type that's like, it's overhyped and I hate it, it sucks, and it, it'll ne it was never good. <laughs> or you're kind of in the middle like me where you're like, eh, it works. Like, it's not incredible, but it works. And again, yes, it's a series that I actually thoroughly enjoyed all the way through. There was some lulling points here and there, and honestly, some decisions by certain characters, like I joked about at the very beginning, the investigators suck. But it still has a lot in here that I actually enjoy. And it's, yes, it's an underdog story. It's the story about the weakest weak that actually is trying to build himself up. He's given an opportunity after surviving a trial to essentially level himself up, unlike anybody else, whatever they get for their abilities in this world, Awakenings, that's what they're stuck with. He actually has the ability to level up his stats and everything, and it's building him up. He's finally able to climb out of the rubble that he has pretty much lived his entire life in. And there's some struggles in there, and I do appreciate that. I think it's got enough in here gamey elements that I actually do enjoy. I've, I've always enjoyed sort of gamifying a fantasy setting but in a lot of cases, it just doesn't work. They don't do enough with the gamey elements to keep my interest. I'll be perfectly honest. Things like Harem and Labyrinth and Another World, that show I just like for the gamey elements. Yes, there's some spicy fan service as well, but <laughs> with solo leveling, it's kind of just pure that. It is the aspect of what somebody would do if they have all these gamey elements to sort of help themselves. An inventory, stats stat boosts, quests that he has to do, and I do appreciate that. I, I think where soul leveling kind of shines the most for me is sort of playing with the mechanics of the world itself. As you kind of have the earlier moments, I think the first episode kind of sucked. <laughs> but as they got further into the double dungeon, that's where the meat and potatoes of the series is for me, and it's something that I kind of experienced again halfway through the series and at the very end. It's sort of when the mechanics of the world and the puzzles of the world and the trials that he goes through have some sort of twist to it that he has to think it through. That's the stuff that I really enjoy. Where I don't enjoy this series so much is when it just comes down to most of the time, the guy just screams and talks about how he can't die yet, and that's how he overcomes every trial that he actually faces. <laughs> Let's be perfectly honest. It has enough in here, and I do like the world and how they've kind of realized the system in this world itself. The idea of the portals showing up, how mankind is sort of learn to deal with them as they're there. Again, like I mentioned earlier, I don't think it's the most insane series ever, but it was an enjoyable ride all the way through, and I'm looking for the next season. Moving on to my number nine, we have Undead Unluck, a series that honestly, sadly, being stuck on certain platforms, I don't think it got as much attention as it deserved. This is definitely kind of a new up and coming show, epic shonen type of series that I am thoroughly enjoying. Now, the reason why it's way down on my nine is because this show sort of has a problem where when it works, it's amazing. And then when it doesn't work, I just want to see the next episode. Like, I just want to get through it. <laughs> this is a show that has lulling points for me where it just does not work. And sadly, for about most of the second half, that was the case for me. I think ever since the betrayal happened in the series, it just kind of lost a lot of its flavor. What made Undead Unluck work for me early on was chemistry. This show, Fuko and Andy are absolutely incredible. I think their chemistry together as a pair 
just works. It's fun. It's yes, it's pervy, but at the same time, it's kind of that obliviousness with it. It's not like an intentional pervy. It's just Andy doesn't know how to interact with people and he doesn't know where his barriers are at. At the same time, Foucault just doesn't want to have anything to do with him, but at the same time, over time, starts to like Andy. It's the, the way they brought these two characters together is pure genius, and I think their chemistry is phenomenal. And to have that chemistry together with between the two of them in a shonen epic like this, a long-running shonen series, I think is something that I am incredibly excited for. It, it's very rare that I have like a main duo pairing characters in a shonen series that I love this much. And again, like I said, as much as I enjoyed the introduction of the Union, as much as I love the introduction to the penalty system, Apocalypse, all that kind of stuff, the overall plot lines of the story, at some point, again, with the betrayal segment and everything beyond that, it just kind of lost me. And that was mainly because a lot of that chemistry felt like it was lost. It got so focused on the backstory, and then we started having sort of those difficulties that are presented in a lot of shonens where... They have five minutes of recap at the beginning of every single episode. I started getting all these little things that were creeping up that was just kind of staining it quite a bit. But still, in the end, I think it's portrayal, the art style, a lot of the action scenes, a lot of the characters, a lot of the mechanics of the world, how every single one of these awakened people have sort of different abilities that are all kind of linked to a word like unluck. <laughs> the ability to give somebody bad luck or undead, just not dying. Um, every single one of these characters has their own unique ability. And I like how they also get into how when somebody's kind of awakened to this, they sort of get disconnected from society. And there's a lot of these different penalties and rules throughout the world that all affect the citizens and, yes, technically them alike. There's a lot of really cool and very interesting mechanics in the show that really does have my attention. I just think at some point it sort of loses it. I am hoping that when we, if we do, and I'm, I'm assuming we do, <laughs> when we do get a second season of this series, that it gets right back into the, what I really enjoy about the series and just kind of takes off. Because it has a very fantastic cast of characters. It has a lot of characters. And I really want to see where they go from here. Moving on to my number eight. Another one that's going to be similar to Undead Unluck, where I love it and I hate it at the same time. <laughs> I really enjoyed the first season of bottom tier character Tomazaki. Now, I will admit that I, if I remember correctly, there was quite a bit of the earlier segments of Tomazaki-kun, the first season, that I didn't really like. But at some point, it just kind of clicked for me. The show itself really clicked for me. It's essentially about this guy, Tomozaki, who is just kind of a geek gamer that thinks that the that the world sucks. Like, like societal norms suck. Like, he's, he's a low-tier character in a world filled with high-tier characters, and he's never going to win in the game of life. Well, this girl ends up showing him how he can kind of spruce himself up, help him with how he interacts with other people, gain friends, and puts him di through different kind of missions to better himself into where he becomes more popular. Now, getting into the second season, I would say this season kind of is split in two different parts. The first half really gets into a bully, Erika. There's a bully in the class, and they're trying to figure out how to resolve it. I really, really like this segment. As much as it was heartbreaking to watch, because, let's be honest, bullying is never fun, it was really interesting in how it kind of played out. I will admit the conclusion of it gets a little bit sort of psychological in how every character is almost psycho psychoanalyzing each other. But at the same time, it was a really good conclusion. And yes, I really love to see Tama and how she developed her own self. Getting into the second half, this is where I have my difficulty. <laughs> the second half kind of stunk. <laughs> the second half was a bit too telegraphed. It was a bit too bait and switchy with the characters. It kind of plays into a trope in rom-coms that I really, really hate. And again, that is the bait and switch. I hate putting so much emphasis on one thing and then ultimately going into another one. I've dealt with it so much in anime that I'm at this point, I know when it's coming and I know how to prepare myself. And this one did it and I hated it, but at the same time, it was a decent conclusion. But I will admit that the entire second half was just a little bit too much. I have to save this one person. They need my help. The timidness, all that kind of stuff that I feel is kind of just not too refreshing. But still, the rest of the show was really fantastic. I really enjoyed it. It's kind of a series that I have a lot of love-hate relationship. On one hand, I really like the characters. I love the art style. I love the chemistry between the characters. But on the other half, yes, it gets a little bit too overly psychoanalyzing each other. That just doesn't feel like these characters are really school kids. <laughs> But I did enjoy it, though. Moving on to my number seven, probably the first in the controversial picks. Yes, The Witch and the Beast. Now, I will admit, this show is a late starter, and it still has one more episode to go. But I'm not going to hold up the entire list just for one show. 
So 11 episodes is enough for me. And I will admit, uh, even no matter how the 12th episode shows up, I think this is a perfect spot in my list for Witch and Beast because I think I'm pretty settled. This show is extremely fantastic. Now, first episode, I will admit, kind of sucks. <laughs> it's kind of an introduction episode. It introduces the characters. It throws one really quick thing in. They resolve the thing. Episode ends. But beyond that, the show kind of turns into sort of different story arcs. So you get like a two to three episode span for different stories with different characters. There is That's probably its only weakness in the series. There is a lot of characters that it's jumping around to, including like Fenora going into Godot and Ashoff, introducing Helga, getting into this over here and this over here. But at the same time, I think each one of these individual stories are fantastic. It has a fantastic cast of characters. They're super interesting. It's basically a world with witches and this one uh, sort of organization that goes out and resolves magic issues and, yes, in often cases, gets involved with witches. And we follow Godot and Ashoff. And Godot has been cursed by a witch and wants to hunt down the witch that actually cursed them. And so it kind of follows them as they go to different locations, handle different tasks, all hoping that one day they'll run into the witch that actually cursed Godot. And again, kind of jumping around out of the characters, you have like Fenora, who's a necromancer and stuff like that. Each one of these individual characters are super fascinating. It's got a great style to it. I wanted Witch Hunter Robin, and I sort of got a little bit of twinge of Witch Hunter Robin, but it's definitely not Witch Hunter Robin. But that's sort of what I got a feel for early on, and I got a little bit of that. But in the end, it's not going to be Witch Hunter Robin, but I think it still did enough for itself. I think the spell systems and all that kind of stuff in the, the world itself is very clever. And again, a lot of the mysteries and artifacts and witches and magic and all this kind of stuff that they have to kind of run into and resolve is truly fascinating. I think a lot of the show is really in the chemistry between Godot and Ashoff. You have Godot who's just like a hothead, just wants to destroy things. Where's the next switch? <laughs> and then you have Ashoff who pretty much has like the leash. And is trying to pull him back and say, chill, let's handle this. This is the best way of doing it. Um, kind of the brains of the party. You got the brains and the bronze, and their chemistry works really well to each other. It's a show that, honestly, I had hopes for. At the same time, didn't expect the studio was going to do a very good job of it. But they pulled it off. They pulled it off enough that it was a very enjoyable series. And yes, number seven of the season. Moving on to my number six, I have Villainous Level 99. I may be the hidden boss, but I'm not the Demon Lord. <laughs> this show was a absolute surprise for me. Uh, honestly, one of those ones where it's like, okay, another Villainous show. It was just literally shrug another Villainous show. And I loved almost every single minute of it. I will admit, like, the last two episodes were kind of shrug. It was a good conclusion. But at the same time, what made this show for me was the first, like, ten episodes. It is just pure, pure comedy gold. It's all because of Yamila. Yamila Dolkness, she it makes the show. She's the main character. She is, again, reincarnated into this world. She is the hidden boss. So you have, like, the Atome games. The main character gets the guys. They go out to defeat the Demon Lord. And then after they defeat the Demon Lord, if they did these certain tasks or these certain accomplishments... At the very end, when they do defeat the Demon Lord, they have to fight the hidden boss. That's who Dulkness is. And she really quickly realized that she's the hidden boss and that she's probably going to have to hide away, doesn't want to get involved with the story at all, wants to stay away from <laughs> the main character and the main cast just so that she never becomes the hidden boss that has to be destroyed. And it was really fun in that regard because you have literally somebody that's trying to distance herself from everybody. She has a very blank expression. She doesn't like to get involved with anything. Very deadpan. Like, she just has these blank looks and expressions. She doesn't... Has, like, very little emotion. And every single punchline that she has is just absolutely funny. She just sees the world through a different lens than anybody else. So, yeah, early on, it's really her being cold and dismissive to everybody, not getting involved. And then later on, it kind of turns into, like, a very quirky attitude in how she'll just... Okay, you guys want to get stronger? I have this horn that if you blow it, it summons mon monsters and you kill the monsters. And she keeps blowing it and everybody's panicking and trying to fight off the mobs and nearly dying. And she just blows the horn again. It just has a lot of fun in that regard. She's super massively overpowered. Um, again, technically level 99, whereas everybody else is like 1 to 3. Um, she's massively overpowered and she she's okay with flexing that. But at the same time... And mixed in there as well is kind of a surprising amount of, like, discrimination. The idea that everybody views her as this demon. A lot of people want to claim that she's a demon lord because of her hair color. Um, so there's a little bit of discrimination in there as well that does pretty well. I, I really did appreciate how they handled it. They didn't get too heavy. They didn't, they didn't treat it disrespectfully. Um, it just worked out well. So overall, it was just comedy gold. I really enjoyed it. Again, I admit the 
last two episodes were kind of shrug, but overall, I really enjoyed it. Moving on to the show that probably nobody that's watching this has watched. <laughs> That is easily my number five. It just it just sits right in the dead center of my my list here. And I think it's a very comfortable spot because this show I really, really enjoyed. But at the same time, I don't think it's perfect. And everything beyond this point is pretty much going to be perfect. <laughs> but my number five is Ishra. Ishra was an absolute treat for me. A series that when I seen the promo and arts and everything for it and the PVs, I really wasn't sure what I was getting into. I just figured it would be like a battler or something like that. Just a battle royale type show, which is sort of is. Uh, but as I watched this show, I was pleasantly surprised. It's one of those shows where honestly, it's very difficult to suggest to people just because I do see criticisms for it as valid. It's one of those ones where when I'm reading negative reviews of it, I go, I can see why you say that. I can see why you feel that. At the same time, it just works for me. It's one of those ones where you just have to watch it and decide for yourself if it's going to be something that works for you or not. But yes, it opens up in this world where all these different individuals are special in some way in the world. The demon lore has been defeated. Mankind's trying to move on. There's very there's only one kingdom left. It's kind of been split into two at some point. And then you have all these very special people that are talented in some way. They're extremely powerful because of one reason. Like you have like Sojuro uh, Yagyu, he's able to cut through anything even though his blade is dull. He knows how to, where the weaknesses of his targets. You have one individual who's a wavering with three arms that just loves diving in the labyrinths and f seeking out challenges and can essentially use any weapon. You have a guy that has like an incredible ability to see things. So he's got like marksmanship and stuff like that. And you have another individual that literally has the world words which in this world, you have words which are able to use magic, but you have to understand the object that you're manipulating. She has the ability to literally manipulate anything just by spoken word. She doesn't have to know it. So she can literally go to some random stranger and say, die, and they just die. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those kinds of stories where it's a lot of extremely OP people that all at some point are going to converge and you're just waiting for the blood to start flying. And then a moment that it does, you're like, holy crap, please don't kill off my favorites. <laughs> don't kill off my favorites. It's very interesting in that regard. Now, my only criticism, but in the end, it didn't really bother me in the end when I look back at it. My only criticism is that, yeah, it spends most of this entire season introducing people. It's literally <laughs> like... I would probably say eight episodes of one half of it being introducing one character, second half being introduced to another character, but it does well in sort of keeping the major plot lines kind of moving with it. But I will admit that there is a sense that you're kind of not getting enough of that story, and so you don't have enough answers. But I think it's one of those slow burn series. It does have a second season coming, and so a lot of my frustrations with the overall plot wanting to have answers of it, I think will eventually get told. It is kind of one of those stories where it's taking its time to reveal things. And yes, in the end, after maybe a season or two or three, it may never answer those things, but I have hopes that it will just because the individual stories that it has told with all these characters are always fascinating. I love the backstory and getting into every single one of these characters, despite the fact that it has too many of them. Um, it's a great story. I really enjoy it. The aesthetic's great. It's got some great animation pieces here and there. Um, overall, it was just a fantastic series that I want more of. Moving on to my number four. Easily the most controversial pick, <laughs> the one that's going to upset some people, and I don't care. Yes, gushing over magic girls, this show was pure, pure gold. Now, my only downside that I'll say about this show is, yes, it's not the greatest looking show animation-wise. It Very quickly, within I think about the eighth episode point, the production quality started going down, let's admit. But they still technically kept the good drawings for when the good drawings are needed, but overall, this show, outside of that, is just pure gold. This is a show that has two assets going for it. Pun not intended, by the way. It's got the etchy goofiness that is Utena and what her whole shtick is. And then on the other end, you have sort of a very creative design around the mechanics of the magic and whatnot in this world. For those that don't know, it essentially takes place in a world that has, yes, magical girls and the bad guys. And the magical girls show up and beat up the bad guys. Well, at some point, you have this one girl, Utna, who's obsessed with magical girls, thinks they're great, and is always watching them. At some point, is confronted by the, the this little kind of mascot for the bad guys and says, hey, you want to be a magical girl too? And turns her into a villain. <laughs> but what opens up from here is that over time, Utna, as Bazer, learns that she has 
a sort of unique trait about herself. She, yes, likes magical girls, but doesn't love them in the way that she thinks she does. She likes to see them suffer. <laughs> she likes to see the different faces they give. So it quickly turns in kind of a, a BDSM magical girl type of show where Bazer will go out, she'll fight the magical girls, she'll put them in compromising positions and embarrass them, and then disappear into a portal. And that's what she adores doing. And what's really great about this is it's almost the creation of the villain character. Starting off with her being like, I don't want to be involved with this. Why'd you turn me into a villain? And then her slapping the magical girls and then suddenly going, I really like this. Why am I enjoying this? Wait, this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. And then over time, you realize that she just embraces it. She literally embraces it. She becomes like this very perverted mind person that just seeks out the next time that she'll do something inappropriate to the magical girls. And then you kind of introduce other characters, the other villains. It's just a blast of a show that I really, really enjoyed. I had so many laugh out loud moments with this series. And yes, mostly, I would probably say 50% of the quality of the show is carried by the seiyuu behind Utna. She just nailed it. And what's so great is that this is a seiyuu that is literally new to the industry. Like, this is one of her first roles. I think she did, like, maybe one or two side roles. But this is, like, her first main role. And I have to say, hats off to her. She made Utna who she was. She has this kind of anxiety in her voice whenever she laughs or whenever she gets into it whenever she gets sinister she nailed it and whenever she gets super excited it's just absolute gold like she literally is going to go down is easily one of the the best seiyus of this season without a doubt so yeah i loved it it was a lot of fun yes it's super pervy it's super etchy so if you don't like those things don't watch it but i thoroughly enjoyed it moving on to my number three i have the apothecary diaries i absolutely love this show from beginning to end maybe having a little bit of a lulling point in there that seemingly is my only justification for not having it being my number two or number one <laughs> let's be honest but no i love this series so much it is just a period piece drama that's done so perfectly it's got this kind of alternate history china following a character who is the daughter of a an apothecary at some point she gets kidnapped sold into the rear palace where she pretty much is unable to resist her urges to get into medicine and poisons and any kind of situation involving any of those and ends up kind of catching the attention of Jinshi, who is sort of the manager of the rear palace. And it kind of turns this whole thing where she'll get some sort of mystery presented to her. She'll kind of investigate it a little bit, solve it, kind of give her reports at the very end. And ultimately, during while she's doing all this, you're sort of getting to know different characters, especially when she is actually in the rear palace, she's meeting all the consorts of the current emperor and kind of getting to each one of their individual stories, what they're kind of going through, what kind of thing they're dealing with. And she has to kind of resolve them. Um, all these different mysteries that she ultimately just geeks out over because she just can't help it. <laughs> she's got like a smidgen of like justice in her, but she just kind of loves poisons and medicines and whatnot. And yeah, even to the point where when she's told that she's going to be a poison tester, she's happy. <laughs> like this is her day. She loves messing with poisons. She likes that tingleness that happens on her tongue whenever she eats poisons. Yes, Mao Mao, the main character is a dork. And that's really what makes the series so enjoyable is that she's just like this little spitfire bundle of fun that you just love to see her just get into mischief. And yes, technically solve the mystery of the current day. It's storytelling is just very hard to beat. It's got great characters. It's got great stories to give to each one of them. It's presented beautifully. It's got some amazing music by Kevin Pinkin. There's just so many things that this series goes just on full cylinders for. And I think the thing that kind of shocked me the most was kind of having this moment where the story is sort of bait and switching you, kind of presenting you different cases and then ultimately allowing you to make your own decision, but at some point making you realize that your justification for those reasons are wrong. It's the best way that I can put it without kind of spoiling it. But it was kind of a bait and switch that I thought was honestly cleverly done. I typically don't like bait and switches or those cases where you feel like the writer is purposely pointing you in one direction and then ultimately going to pull the rug out from under you and say, ha ha, aren't I clever? No, you weren't clever. You just, you presented this as being the obvious choice. Um, it, it did it so well and I absolutely loved it. It, it kind of led to a finale for this season that just completely had me emotional. Like the getting the backstories of certain characters and revelations around uh, Mau Mau and her relationships with her family was just absolutely fantastic. It was just so beautifully portrayed. Yes, like I mentioned earlier, 
it does have a lulling point. Um, it was a little bit after the first core ended that it had like this segment of like four episodes that weren't the greatest, but it still had plenty of great Mau Mau moments, at which we all come here for the Mau Mau moments, and <laughs> that I absolutely loved. Leaf Hu's story, Gilkyo's story, there's just so many fantastic stories in there that I just loved, and I cannot wait for a second season. All right. Now let's get into number two and number one. And honestly, if you ask me in 20 minutes, I might change my mind. It, this is honestly one of those cases where number two and number one, they're both perfect. They're both 10 out of 10. And then deciding which one is above the other one is a near impossibility. It's one of those cases where they do completely different things. So how do you actually put them head to head against each other? In the end, I decided number two, Fair and Beyond Journey's End, and honestly think it is a number one. I would just probably say both of these next two are going to be tied for number one. Let's just say that, <laughs> but that would be cheating. But no, my number two, Fair and Beyond Journey's End, I have absolutely enjoyed this show from beginning all the way to the end. It has been absolutely beautifully portrayed, beautifully adapted. Madhouse went on all cylinders. It was a show that was presented on a feature film block that doesn't normally do anime, and it shows because how much budget and quality, the amazing directing that was done for it, the amazing music by Evan Call, just everything about this show was what I would consider perfection. It, it just through and through was a beautiful show. It essentially follows this elf who was a part of the hero's party who essentially outlives the hero's party because she's an elf, sort of regretting that she never paid attention to those around her. She went this entire 10 years of the hero's party, not trying to pay any mind, but then really quickly regrets it and ultimately goes down the path that the hero's party took in order to relive those memories. It's a very beautifully told story in that regard. But additionally, on top of her story, you're getting all these other side characters that each individually have their own story and conflicts they're going through. It does a really good job of kind of spending enough time with each character while not like insanely deep stuff that takes 10 episodes to get into, it does enough to really hit the point that each of the characters are going through in a very significant way. Add on to that some very interesting uses of the mechanics of the world itself, the magic itself, how it's kind of, for the most part, kind of bred from the demons, how humans have kind of adopted the magic itself, how the magic itself works, how each individual demons kind of has their own specialty that they've kind of crafted over many years. There's just so much to kind of go through with this entire series. And again, like I said before, done just absolutely beautifully. Um, amazing animation set pieces and all that kind of stuff. In the end, Fur and Beyond Journey's End, like I said before, is a perfect anime. It's a 10 out of 10 anime. I would not change a single thing about it. I love it to death. I really badly want a second season. <laughs> Please announce a second season already, but we'll see. And finally, drum roll, my number one anime of the winter 2024 anime season. If anybody knows me, they know exactly what I'm going to say. The Dangers in My Heart second season. This show, my gosh, is absolutely incredible through and through. It is easily going to go down as my favorite romance of all time. It is great character drama. It's great slice of life. It's great comedy beats. All mixed into a romance story that I thoroughly enjoyed. A rare case of a romance story where I actually understand the characters in the end and understand why they love each other. There's so many romance anime that I watch where I just don't really like, okay, yeah, sure, that, that's, the, that's obvious, that's a character they can choose, but I never get fully invested in seeing the characters actually come together. And Danger of My Heart just absolutely nails it. I, I said very early on with the first season, I, I was kind of warm on it. Like the first few episodes, I was very warm on it. And I think a lot of people kind of echoed that because there was a lot of trending charts that were showing this show kind of started out very low in the scoring. And then at the same point that I was kind of mentioning, it just takes off. I always mention the basketball in the face moment. Once the basketball in the face moment hits in the first season, that's when the show takes off. And it never lets go. Going into the second season, honestly, I felt like every episode was a finale. Like it was a, a peak moment in storytelling finale. And I was like, how are they going to one-up themselves? And the next episode does it. And the next episode does it. There was only maybe one episode where I didn't feel like, holy crap, that was an insane episode. Literally every episode of this season just grabs you and doesn't let go. It is truly a beautiful adaptation. The studio and the team behind it did an incredible job taking a manga and kind of moving certain things around, adding a lot of dialogue that really did 
kind of take a lot of these moment-to-moment segments of the manga to a whole nother level. This is a true example of how, similar to Freren too, I'll say the same for that, truly an example of how a studio can really make something into an anime. It's not just an adaptation. It is an anime. This is peak, peak anime. It's got great characters. Yamada and Ichikawa's relationship is fantastic. The side characters are so much fun. I love the sister Kana. Moika's fantastic. Uh, in this season, we also introduced a new cast of characters with a new class, the new year itself, with like Hanzawa and Kankan. It just, every character kind of comes together for the story so perfectly. But at its core, like I said, is Ichikawa and Yamada. Their relationship is where it's at. Ichikawa is somebody that has never really had much confidence in himself, kind of slowly being pulled out of that darkness, that, that hollowness that he's in by Yamada. And the unique aspect that the story's always had is that Yamada herself never has a perspective episode. The story never gives us a Yamada's perspective. So we have to kind of guess just like Ichikawa does. And I think that's a very unique way of storytelling, especially for a romance like this, is to never really know what Yamada's thinking you have to go based off of her body language. You have to go based off of what she actually says. And I love how every now and then you will actually get that. You'll get those indications just based on how she's moving, which again, the studio absolutely nails. When your only real way of perceiving what a character's going through is body language, you gotta pull that off really well. And again, I think the studio did a fantastic job of it. But yeah, easily, hands down, no doubt, 10 out of 10, Danger to My Heart is easily my number one anime of the winter 2024 anime season. And my gosh, I hope we get a season three. But that's it. That is my top 10 anime of the winter 2024 anime season. For my honorable mentions, I have Seventh Loop. I really enjoy that show. I think at some point it kind of just, it kind of petered off for me, which is kind of the same case for things like Weakest Tamer. It had a really great start, very unique show, but over time just kind of dwindled off. Same with Sign of Affection. There's a lot of shows this season where I think I got about to the six episode point and they kind of just came back down for me. Sasaki and Peeps is another example of that. Great start, petered off. Uh, Chain Soldier was really a lot of fun. I enjoyed that show, but to be honest, it was mostly just to kind of see the absurd sort of things that he would get rewards of. It did have an interesting twist to the mechanics of what he is, his ability to turn into this monster, which I thought was kind of interesting towards the later part. And yes, the Thirsty Siscon was, was a lot of fun as well. <laughs> and finally, additionally, I'll probably mention uh, Bang Brave Bravern. That was a very, very interesting show. I will admit that it has a twist at some point that I just very much so shrugged at. <laughs> it was kind of one of those like, oh, we're doing this thing. That makes no sense, but sure, let's do it. It's a lot of fun. But no, it is a definitely a show that I really did thoroughly enjoy. It was a lot of fun in regards to having sort of a very serious mecha, like apocalyptic setting where like the aliens are coming down to destroy everybody. But at the same time, an absolute geek of a mecha shows up out of nowhere. A super robot shows up that's an absolute nerd and they just fight back. And it, again, it has a lot of like yaoi undertones, a lot of thirstiness in it that kind of just gives a lot of kind of a, of a unique flavor to it. It is, it is just kind of trying to make fun of the super robot, but while being a super robot in a very, very gruesome and, and serious world. And it just works. It just, it's, it's got a chemistry that actually just works. And I really enjoyed it. And yes, of course, I'm still enjoying Delicious in Dungeon. I think it's fantastic. Tsukimichi second season. Sengoku Yoku, even though it breaks my heart every now and then, is doing really good as well. And yes, I'm still watching Udisa Yatsura that I'm really enjoying. So I hope you guys enjoyed this top 10 anime of the winter 2024 anime season. I hope you guys join me for spring, as I will, of course, be going through all the shows of the spring 2024 anime season, giving my first impressions of every single one of them, giving an idea of what you're expecting, my thoughts on it and all that kind of stuff um, definitely stick around again hit that subscribe button if you haven't already additionally make sure to hit that like button down below if you like this video leave me a comment let me know what your top 10 anime are of the winter 2024 anime season i always like to go down there and see your guys's responses and yes for other people that don't like my list because so leveling's too low or something <laughs> they can check out your list as well so we can kind of just give each other ideas of things that we may have missed but yeah i hope you guys enjoyed and as always if you like this content and you want to support the channel more add patreon link tips links so thanks membership button down below greatly appreciate it, but it does and y'all take care